So good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Um, I am looking forward to this conversation because Andrea and I had a lot of really rich brainstorming together. Um, this was born of uh, the creation of a teaching resource when I had this moment of like, hmm, this doesn't feel right. I feel like maybe I need to revisit this and think about it a little bit more. And in, um, in conversating and thinking out loud with Andrea, we started to kind of unpack the challenge of teaching propaganda while also recognizing that the depictions of people in the propaganda are problematic. And if students only see those depictions of certain people, it shapes the stories that they tell. So our big ideas, as you see, are we can teach history in ways that include people of color without focusing on trauma or reinforcing stereotypes. And we can question the main story in our curriculum and teach content from multiple perspectives. So that's what we're aiming to do together today. And in order to do so, we're going to take a look at an artwork step by step. And then next we will start to layer in information. And that's why having Andrea here is really important. She's from the Asian Pacific American Center and can give us a really rich unpacking of the artwork and its historical context. Um, and then we're going to bring things back together and to start to think about um, this from a systems perspective. So starting to think about um, what role power and um, propaganda might play in the, the big ideas that we've um, played with together. And then finally, this is why I asked for an hour and a half of your time, we're going to link back to the idea of this teaching and kind of take a metacognitive break as teachers and think about what value this might bring. So that's the big arc that we're doing together. We'll see how much we get through because I always overstuff. Um, so let's get started. Um, in the chat box, when I say go, which is not yet, my invitation to you is to describe the figure that you see here exquisitely. So when I say exquisitely, I'm asking you to look really, really carefully at this figure. And then using your richest, juiciest adjectives, the ones that really capture what you see, shape and craft a description as this figure is presented in this work. So. Make sure you look all over the artwork. This is just half of it, it's cut on a diagonal. And then go in the chat box, please exquisitely describe this figure. Denise has started us off with a beautiful word, pensive, contemplative, thoughtful, dreaming into the beyond, wistful, delicate, secretive. Oh, Sarah just brought the, the poetic, okay, we've got the sheen of black hair carefully pulled back. Contemplative is getting more love. Okay, I love this. Floating in thought, thought. a lovely, half a figure in half shadow, blank pages. What is she thinking? We have questions about her, fantastical, reflective. So there's a lot of these words that have to do with her mental state, which is really interesting because it's hard to see someone's mental state. Um, we've got contrasting patterns and colors, something like porcelain, a pallor, interesting. Um, oh, Christine is bringing background knowledge. This is a Roger Shimomura painting based on a Yuki, oh, oh E, there we go, figure. Beautiful, thank you. Gray shoji screen divided into squares, traditional dress. Beautiful. So we started with kind of her face, it seems, and her mental state. And now we're allowing our thinking to sort of ripple outward. And Ruth is adding Asian women in traditional clothing, probably kneeling in a somewhat pensive mood, sitting in front of calligraphic materials. Beautiful. Okay. Oh, my friends. So this is the description of the woman that we see in this scene. I'm going to try to find the carrot on my keyboard. Okay. So that we have just a running list that everything above this point is the woman in the chat. And then my invitation to you is to do the same exquisite description of the other figure that I've just revealed or semi-revealed, I guess. So before you type anything down, make sure you've really like got it in your head. 
what this is all of, you know, what, what are you seeing? What are, what's the vibe coming off of this part of the artwork? And then go in the chat box, exquisitely describe this figure. Heroic superhero came immediately to the fore. Okay, powerful stance of a mysterious figure. Silhouette of American Superman. Um, it's got a shape, it's shadowy, it's muscular. Um, there's a cape blowing in the wind, um, aggressive. Christine is adding white supremacy. I cannot wait to come back to that, thank you. Uh, no grounding, Sarah, I'd love to know more what you, when you say no grounding, I, I just need a little help there. Uh, Ruth says the shadow of a powerful threatening superhero with cape billowing, hands on hips. <laughs> With Sperger, thank you for bringing the humor. Maybe he's a peeper, totally fair. Um, bold, confident, strong, solid form, looming shadow, Western. Denise is using the word floating. We had floating for the female figure as well, which I think is interesting. Ah, thank you, Sarah. So the, the lack of the bottom legs, we can't see the legs all the way to the ground. So it seems like he's kind of just up there. Um, Nick is adding soldier shadow or ghostly, imposing. Okay, wonderful. So before we move any further, my challenge to you is to use the chat box as a documentation. So scroll back through to the top where we saw the woman um, and all the descriptors you gave and um, kind of take the temperature of those words and then scroll down to the shadow words and take the temperature of those words. And then just in the chat box, make any notes that you have about kind of any contrasts you see in the words that we used. Ooh, gendered language, love, okay, calm and pensive versus aggressive, powerful and powerless, um, female is grounded and visceral, okay, gentle versus aggressive, anything more, soft versus hard, delicate versus rough, inside versus outside, Ooh, Gail is noting that she is part shadow. So maybe there is something dual about her as well. Thank you. Masculine, ambiguous, luminous versus shadowy. So what an interesting thing that there were the words like um, porcelain for the female, which is de definitely delicate, but it also has a luminous quality to it. Um, gentle and peaceful versus strong and threatening, um, past and present, beautiful. Okay. so. Just hold on to this because of course we know that words are really powerful and in this case the artist has made a series of choices that we are interpreting through our lens and putting these words out into the world right. Um, so then. In addition to the differences in the words that we used. How were the figures different so like what has the artist given us that is different we make some notes in the chat box. What has the artist given us? I'm trying to type and just talk at the same time. <laughs> that is different. And I'm doing this just as a teacher talk moment. Sometimes if the audio is breaking up or if you have a kid who doesn't process particularly well auditorially, I have found it's helpful to put the question in the chat. So that's why I'm doing that. I am one of the kids who doesn't process very well auditorially. So I'm also doing it to help myself. <laughs> Ah, okay, look at this. I love what's happening in here. So we, we have lots of contrasts. Some we, um, I think it was maybe Abby at the start mentioned the, the level of detail in the seated figure um, versus the outline of the silhouette. Um, we've got high, physically high and physically low. Um, and then we're noting um, the, the amount of space that the bodies take up, like the masculine figure is kind of filling up, filling up the space. Um, the feminine figure seems to be kind of a little bit more compressed to the bottom of the um, uh, canvas. There we go. 
<laughs> Deborah, thank you for noticing that the panels feel like a grid. And so, right, we have the idea, maybe this is an allusion to a shoji screen. And then also I'm gonna ask you to collectively put a little pin in that idea of this grid, because if you don't already know this artwork, there's there, that's an intentional choice of the artists. Um, we have the horizontal versus the vertical um, and two different planes. I love this. So there's a lot that's different. And my curiosity at this point turns us to similarities. Is there anything, is, is there any way that we can find that these figures are similar? The shadows are getting a lot of attention. They're facing the same direction, perhaps? I love that. Okay, anything more that's similar? The drape of the clothing, okay. Ah, Ruth, in some sense, they're both stereotypes. I love that. We're going to unpack that, unpack that together. I know Ruth and she's a smarty, so we're, we've got a lot to talk about. Um, the windows, the linear quality, beautiful. The horizontal bench. Oh, I've never seen that before. Thank you. So how horizontal this bench or table is and the horizontalness of the cape blowing out. Um, the line that's intersecting the 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 figure on the ground that who I'm calling female um, seems to also intersect to the cape of the man. So there's actually like a physical connection there. The one that I didn't get to that's above my question in the chat is Sarah's um, note that um, they're both part of the grid, which is interesting to me. Um, both are seen through something else. Okay, very cool. Um, body language being used to convey an attitude. Wonderful. Uh, and the idea of they both have something to do. One's doing the job of being a hero and one is perhaps doing the job of writing. Um, Sarah's adding they're both in boxes. Beautiful. Okay. So at this point, whether you know this artwork and a billion things about it, or you've never seen it before in your life, what are you wondering? Would you please just drop one question in the chat about something, just anything that you're wondering? The title. Ooh, okay. Love this with the relationship. Oh, does she know he's there? Okay, cool. Hero. So there's like a lot of questions about the role of this shadowy figure. What's, what's, is he threat? Is he a positive force? What's going on? Is the woman inside even aware that he's there? Um, is there, what's the writing all about? Is this projection, this shadow actually a projection of, in her mind instead of in reality? Who is meant to see this work? Um, what will she write? So, I mean, just for those of you who need to figure out how to turn some history lesson into a creative writing lesson, what a neat thing it would be to, to task people with like, read a little bit about this time period, about this scene, and then imagine what, in fact, she might write. That's great. Where is the room? What's her status? All right, beautiful. So put a pin in all those questions because I think they're all about to get answered. I'm going to put in the chat box two questions that I'm going to ask you to use as we move through the next part of this session. And the two questions have to do with um, recognizing that throughout history, there have been a series of decisions made by individuals. And when those individuals' decisions start to create a system, that system has wider and wider impacts. And if we start to recognize that people made the system and the system is working the way that it was probably meant to work, we can also recognize that there are ways to change the system. So the two questions are, who is involved And then what systems are involved? I'm writing this in the chat, but I'm actually gonna ask you to grab that piece of paper where you made your notes at the start and jot down, as you hear this information from Andrea, jot down who, who's, people that you hear about. And then also systems that you hear her either name by name or alternatively you recognize there's a system participating in, in this. Um, so before I turn you all over to Andrea, does anyone have any questions about the task, the writing, just the note taking that you're doing on your piece of paper? Gorgeous, my friends. All right. Andrea, you can cue me for 
advancing the slides. I will listen for that, but yeah. I'm going to be quiet now. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I had so much fun looking through the chat to see uh, what everyone was um, um, adding. And I have to say, I was looking at the painting in a different way. I'm really excited to be talking about Roger Shimamura. Roger, Roger is one of my favorite artists, and I've had the great pleasure of seeing many works of Roger's. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited that we're going to talk about this one. This is one I could look at all day because there's so many more questions and things to look at in there and so many things to wonder. Um, so I'm going to share some information about the artist and um, some more information about the painting as well, and then expanding out to talk more about um, the historical, uh, the, the many historical stories, the histories surrounding this painting and the story that Roger is telling with us. So here you see in the top right corner is Roger Shimamura himself. Uh, Roger Shimamura has made paintings, prints, and theater pieces that address the social and political issues of Asian America. And combining his childhood interest in comic books, American pop art, as we can see from just how we were looking through that painting together, and Japanese woodblock prints to create his signature style. This is something we've already discussed in the chat. So this mix embraces his Japanese ancestry while also making him a part of modern American art. And I have to say one of my personal favorites of his, the, the, the painting that got me uh, hooked on being a, a fan of Roger Shimomura was he took a, a painting of Hello Kitty and imposed his face over the kind of cartoony Hello Kitty face. So I was, I was hooked. <laughs> uh, click please. And then we have um, a piece of the puzzle here. So the Shimomura family immigrated to the US in 1912 during the height of the 20th century Japanese immigration. Once in the US, Japanese immigrants were subject to racial hostility, which only intensified as many Japanese found success and prosperity in their new country. This, uh, so here you see in this picture, this is a very young Roger Shimomura smiling on the lap of his grandmother, Toku Shimomura. All right, next please. So following the December 7, uh, December 7, 1941 attack on Pearl Harbor, the federal government froze the bank accounts of Japanese Americans who were seen as posing a potential national security threat. A few days later, the government permitted Japanese Americans to withdraw small amounts for living expenses. Uh, the date in this painting's title refers to the date of a diary entry by Toku Shimomura, which reads, I spent all day at home. Starting from today, we were permitted to withdraw $100 from the bank. This was for our sustenance of life. We who are the enemy to them. I deeply felt America's large heartedness in dealing with us. Right, next slide, please. After the attack on Pearl Harbor, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed Executive Order, Order 9066 on February 19, 1942, which forcibly removed approximately 120,000 Americans of Japanese, of Japanese ancestry living on the West Coast to isolated internment camps in many Western states and even in the South. Toku and her family, including a three-year-old Roger, were removed from their home in Seattle, Washington, and transferred in August of 1942 to the Minidoka Relocation Center in Idaho, where they lived for the duration of the war. At its peak, Minidoka incarcerated 9,400 Japanese Americans. Living conditions in camps were extremely difficult, Families lived in thin walled barracks through harsh winters and harsh summers without many of their personal belongings, many of which were left behind. When Executive Order 9066 was posted, one of the instructions was to only bring what you could carry. And in the camps, guards were posted everywhere monitoring activities taking place in the camp. So if you look at this slide, you'll see the top black and white photo shows households, personal belongings on the sidewalk in the yards in front of the household. These are personal household goods, uh, personal ephemera, cameras, photographs, clothing, um, furniture. What, imagine having what you have in your home and then being told you can only bring with you what you can carry. Um, and if you think about two suitcases and what you could put in there, um, an activity I always like to do with young students and talking about this history is what would you put in that suitcase? Um, and it, it gets very complicated too in just what was not allowed to be um, included in, in these, um, in what people could carry, but it was very limited as you can see. And as we go down into this grid here, you can see another black and white photograph of two guards um, and another guard on the phone uh, watching activity taking place. Next slide, please. 
I'm going to just pause and invite you to remember the two questions. So you're on a search, right? So you're on a search for people and also systems. So if you would please jot down anything that you haven't captured yet, and that way you'll be able to listen um, to these really, I think, rich um, historical and personal historical um, details. Thank you. That's a good place to pause. Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> And Christine, thank you for your note. I'm really, um, I'm really glad you're here. And um, I feel like you're going to give us an awful lot of understanding um, by being here. Thank you. Right. I share that sentiment, Christine. Um, also, it's great to have you on, on this call. Your artwork is incredible. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop talking and I'll also advance the slide. If you remember, I know we're, we're busy taking notes and absorbing information, but on the previous slide, there was um, a miniature version of this photograph that you see here of this artwork on a newsletter. Um, I, um, this is such an important object to talk about, and I'm glad we have this included here. Um, and when you first take a look at it, it's a hand-drawn figure with Fighting Americans too at the very top with the description underneath, uh, which we'll um, read in just a moment. But why do we include this? particular image in this presentation. Um, approximately 33,000 Japanese Americans served in the military during World War II. Many volunteered to serve as a way to show patriotism and loyalty to the United States. In camp, there were loyalty questionnaires that uh, incarcerees had to fill out. Um, and there are, many, uh, there are many inspiring stories of resistors who refused to do this. The most decorated army unit in World War II was the 442nd Infantry Regiment. Uh, which is primar primarily composed of Japanese American men. One of them was Daniel Inoue, who volunteered shortly after the attack on Pearl Harbor. And if that name sounds familiar, uh, da Daniel Inoue also became a senator for the state of Hawaii. This newsletter artwork that we're looking at right now is a drawing from the Smithsonian National Museum of American History and shows a Japanese American soldier or a Nisei soldier. Nisei is a word that's typically used to describe people of Japanese ancestry born in the US and Canada. And when you look at this picture, one thing that always draws me in is the look on this Nisei soldier's face, the look of determination in serving for the US to make, uh, to make his voice known, um, to prove that they are American, never having known another land to call home. Uh, many Nisei soldiers experienced many personal dilemmas with their service, fighting for a country that also imprisoned their own families, their friends, and their communities. So who's protecting who? When we look at the description underneath that's been expanded, it says, we believe in democracy and dedicate ourselves to the furtherance of its principles. To uphold these principles, we must destroy every form of tyranny, oppression, and violation of human rights. We place our faith in America and base our hope in the future on that faith. Therefore, we believe that our volunteering in the armed forces of this country is a step towards the realization of these ends and a positive manifestation of our loyalty to the United States of America, written by uh, volunteers from Topaz, Utah, where one camp was located. All right. Okay, thank you, Andrea. And I invite you to jump in at any point, any, anybody, um, but Andrea, especially um, to add questions, to add nuance, anything like that. Before we move on, make sure that you've jotted down on your paper any new um, people or systems that came up with that last slide. When we're thinking about these people, we're thinking about history as an active messy place instead of a passive packaged place. Um, and the systems um, are changeable, but we have to know that they're there. And so we're surfacing them at this point together. So my challenge for you, and this is a challenge that we can do together if it would feel more fun. I'm totally open to that. My challenge to you, though, at this point is to create kind of a flow chart. So choose maybe the five most intriguing systems that you discovered or that you jotted down. 
and start to think about who participated in those systems or who was affected by those systems. And then make some notes on your page. So first step, step one, I'm gonna put this in the chat also, step one, ooh, I put step ex exclamation point. <laughs> step one, choose five intriguing systems from your notes. Who was affected by or participated in those systems? And you're just making notes at this point. You're kind of like moving the information around on the paper so that you're moving it around in your brain. And for you speedy folks, I've put step two in the chat. This is no pressure if you're still working on step one. I'm gonna put three minutes on my timer. And I'll come back to you when it goes off. So that's three minutes to do both steps. And if you don't get there, it's okay. No stress. Ah, <gasps> Miss Downey. You have given us a gift by asking this question. So when I say systems, I mean any set of interconnected parts. So that could be a social system like um, manners, for instance, like as is a, is a way that we work together. Um, and voting might be another system. Alternatively, tanks are a system. Um, the postal system is a system. So really anything that you, you conceive of as a bunch of individual parts working together to achieve something else counts as a system in my book. Anybody else have a question? Because they I, I appreciate that you put it there. Ah, Deborah, thank you. Yeah, not just institutions. It can be, it can be anything, which I probably could have started us off with and make the listening part a lot, make a, a make the note taking and the listening part make a lot more sense. Thank you for asking these questions. All right, for real this time though, I'm gonna start the, the timer. All right, friends, you're about halfway through your time.
If you are super speedy or you like a challenge, you have one minute left. My challenge to you is to add a new system into the mix and see how it might be interconnected with other systems. If you will begin finishing this thought wherever you are, or at least putting, putting it on pause. I am going a bit off script because I want to play in breakout rooms. Um, and the reason I want to do this just for a teacher talk thing um, is because we have so many varied experiences in here. I know some of you already, and you know this artwork and you know a lot about it and other folks are new to me. Um, and I just want to give you all an opportunity to talk to, together about what you're doing. So I'm gonna put you in rooms where you wind up having about four or five people in that room. And my invitation to you is to just talk through, as the person has just started in the, in the chat box, talk through with each other, um, what systems did you uncover? And then when you started to chart them out and think about how they are interconnected and how power and resources move among them, what did you discover? So those are our two thinking questions. The questions are in the breakout rooms. Sorry, I would have had this already typed up again, teacher talk, um, but as I said, I'm going off the script. So um, <laughs> in the breakout rooms, talk about which systems you uncovered, how they are interconnected, and what you discovered when you tried to chart the movement of power or resources between them. That is gonna be the next six minutes of your life. So I will see you all soon when we come back to this room. And you'll just need to click the little um, go to your room button. To my breakout group, I was talking when it got cut out. Thank you all. It was really nice being in that session with you. <laughs> Welcome back. I, I apologize. I know it's such a funny thing to be zoomed into an entirely other place. Like you're just removed from the middle of a conversation. So my apologies. Oh, no. um, I hope that was a fruitful discussion. And what I hope you would be willing to do is one representative from each of the breakout rooms, would you be willing to just unmute and share out loud if you're comfortable, um, something that you discovered over the course of your conversation? Or if you're shy, which is okay. Hi, this is Denise yeah, from, group, from group three. I'm, when teachers ask, I'm always like, be the first. Because <laughs> um, you hate it when people don't. So group three and anybody else can speak up. But I, I think our group was actually kind of surprised at how we struggled to make a, a, these linear connections that we were way more of the mind of collaging um, ideas and layering them so that, you know, trying to create a linear response to this was was challenging for us. There's just so much here. Awesome. So when it is hard to create a linear connection, what does that tell you about the systems we're discussing? They are not linear. <laughs> ah, fascinating. Okay. Thank you, group three. I'm taking notes in the chat. Um, Anybody else willing to jump in? What did you, what did you group, do? Group five was not all that different from group three in the sense of seeing a whole bunch of 
um, personal, governmental, um, and other relationships that were interrelated and hard to untangle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's good to see your face, Ruth. And in group two, I think we talked about a lot of the contradictions, the fact that there were, you know, certain things put into place, but then the act absolute opposite was actually happening. So for example, the soldiers were had guns that they were pointing at other countries and but at the same time when they came home to visit, the guards had their guns trained on their on the first group of soldiers thank families. You. Yeah, and thank you. It's good to see your face too. So I'm going to put if this is too weird a shorthand, I'm going to put soldiers were pointing guns at enemies and um what do we call each other when we are we are all citizens of the same country? We are countrymen. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Groups one and two, uh, one and four. Did you discover anything? Um, I can speak. I I'm sorry. I don't remember my actual group number. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> group question and mark. We had this fabulous question um, that we were kind of centralizing around, and that was how long do you have to live here before you are really considered to be an American? Mm -hmm. And so this concept had many layers and, and showed the webbing, um, not only historically, but especially in relationship to the Japanese American. Mm -hmm. And so we also talked about the concept of stereotypes, stereotypes rather, um, and just um, how that all interconnected. So it was it was a, a really nice look at, at more the dynamics of that than it was about um, specific spots that connected. Beautiful. Thank you. Our anchor group, any thoughts are welcome. And if you were all like ones and twos at the start of this, and this was a bad day, then <laughs> feel free to say, I just needed to look at other human beings who weren't asking anything of me and talk about how it was a rough day. That's okay too. Okay, if you think of anything, jump in. We'd be glad to hear from you. All right, so I'm going to turn you back over to Andrea because she's got a question for you. All right. Um, so what we see here, we see um, this beautiful painting by Roger Shimamura, and then you'll see to the right, there is a map to give you a visual of where these camps are located. And something and, like Andrea, to... speak into the mic more. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this better? Yes. Okay, I, will, I had my arms crossed, I won't do that. Um, so um, when you look to the right, you can see a visualization of where the camps were, where assembly centers were located. Um, it, just to kind of give you a sense for where, where they were located. One thing I mentioned earlier is that many were located in isolated areas, uh, desert, um, you know, not really close to many big towns. Um, and then when you go to the bottom, there is a link to the Densho organization, and there's a link that I think should work if you click on it. Is that correct? Um, oh, there's a link in the chat. I would love if everyone could link, uh, click on that link in the chat, because we're going to ask some questions about what you see in this resource. So um, I should also introduce who is Densho. Uh, Densho um, is a really important organization. Uh, they work tirelessly to preserve, educate, and share the story of World War II era incarceration of Japanese Americans. And I, I encourage everyone to look through it. It's an incredible database for free that you, with free access to a number of oral history interviews and video interviews um, and articles about this history. And it's important to look through this because there is no singular story of this history. There are many complicated and complex stories associated with this timeline that um, with this time that goes back hundreds of years and we can even start seeing some ramifications today. Um, so I encourage everyone to visit. Um, but for the purposes of this workshop, now that everyone is looking at the timeline, um, I hope that you'll consider the following questions and I'm going to ask them kind of slowly and I think Elizabeth, my co-host here, uh, is going to be so kind to, to write them out. but. We invite you to just absorb the timeline, think about what you discuss in your breakout sessions, and just think, as you look through this resource, just kind of share your reactions to these questions. Um, so I'll begin. Uh, as you look through the timeline, notice all the dates, notice the acts. So who had power, and what kind of power did they have?
Another question is what does propaganda have to do with power? And how does propaganda and power impact those who are oppressed? What assumptions led to the incarceration of Japanese Americans? And what role might propaganda have played in this event and how did it impact the voiceless? And then finally, going back to the original source of this conversation, what the, what's sparking all of this is the painting itself. How is Roger Shimamura addressing this in his work? These are a lot of questions. They're all in the chat. Thank you, Elizabeth. So feel free when when you're willing to share when you're comfortable sharing something um, in the chat a reaction another question or a thought as just an aside as folks are looking at the timeline I always have to stop and rem remind myself of everything that happened before Executive 906, nine, after, well, everything leading up to when Executive Order 9066 was signed. Because it's not just Pearl Harbor. You have to go back even further and even further and even further, even beyond the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 to see how these events, events that happened in Japan, events that happened across the Pacific, events that happened in Hawaii, and events that happened on the West Coast that led to that happening. And then, of course, when the camps were closed, what happened after? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Denise. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Denise. So just like Denise did, like if anything that, that you notice, especially regarding the um, exercise of power um, and the role of propaganda, if you'll just grab some of those ideas and drop them in the chat. What I'm going to do is put, I'm going to do another kind of three minute block just so you know that we're not going to be here for always, but rather, you know, we're, we're working together deliberately. Um, so in that three minutes, find something, some nugget that you are holding on to that you think you can bring back together um, to the larger group. And we will take all of those nuggets together and start talking through those questions that Andrea posed. So I'm going to put three minutes on the timer.
Okay, so 20 more seconds, which is insufficient, and I apologize. So Ruth, being the, the question asker she is, and beloved for her hard questions that, well, isn't all art political in the chat? And I agree, there, that's how I stand on it. Most, like art is intentionally, generally has a, has a, has a uh, message and it's infrequently neutral. Um, so then um, I started just dropping in the chat where you can see kind of interspersed um, a couple of the um, kind of criteria that we might use to gauge whether something is propaganda or persuasion. Um, and one way to go with this, if you were teaching in the classroom and you were you know, in, in, uh, required rather to teach specifically what is propaganda, um, that would definitely be a necessary kind of front load to this particular lesson. And there's some really great resources on read, write, think, and some other places for how to talk, especially with like middle schoolers about that kind of squishy difference between the two, what's persuasion and what's propaganda. Um, so with the understanding that we have not yet established like a common understanding of, of what specifically we mean by propaganda in this session, it, we'll just kind of let that be a little bit loose, but I'm gonna turn it back over um, to a Andrea, there we go, <laughs> and <laughs> let you drive this part. Yeah. Um, first, I just want to thank everyone for adding um, these thoughts and um, questions in the chat. It's a lot to take in. Um, it's a lot to take in. And I think we've all kind of illustrated here in the chat that it's not just one singular event or one singular person or system. It's, it's a series that has evolved over time. And as we can see here from the example shared, it's a lot of the laws and the power in these systems that we've been talking about has impacted either at times in American history, one particular racial group or many or, the, or categories of racial groups. And the categories of race have changed over time. Definitions of whiteness have changed over time. Uh, definitions of who can be a citizen has changed over time. And so when you think, I think someone said at the top, you have people in all of the branches of government, they're the ones driving uh, the, the maintenance of these systems. Um, and as we can see, it's, it, it, further, it has further oppressed so many people. Um, so I, I thank everyone for diving into this timeline. Um, I refer to it quite a bit because it's, as I mentioned before, a really great reminder for how this didn't happen in just a vacuum and um, how so many groups and impacts have, um, so many groups have uh, decisions made, oppressing groups have impacted other groups. And it's, I think, uh, something we should constantly think about as we think about systems is how is one set, how is power impacting not just one group, but how that, that impact impacts everybody in some way or form. So um, yeah, that's all I really have to share about this to kind of close out this slide. Um, but I really appreciate uh, everyone here chiming in. This has been a really rich conversation. I think we could take this in so many different directions and so many possibilities. Uh, so thank you very much. So my query for you, because the title of this session was that we're challenging propaganda. What have you discovered about propaganda without looking at propaganda so far? <laughs> like what, what have you uncovered just to like make this explicit? Cause that's what you signed up for. So like, what does this have to do with propaganda? Everything we've just talked about. Are you asking someone to respond? Yeah, whomever would like to jump in. Oh, okay, well, I believe that propaganda was used in the internment of Japanese Americans to, uh, create a lie, a lie that would get them off of the land. Japanese Americans were the most successful farmers in California. They dominated the agricultural industry because they work hard and they circumvented laws that barred them from owning land, but they were able to overcome that. And they were a tremendous force in the economy in California. So I believe that the propaganda of World War II was to get them off of the land. They were sent uh, east, all their land was exposed to other Euro-American farmers who then usurped it. 
you can see the same thing happening in slavery. White indentured servants and black indentured servants marched together in 1619. So the propaganda around African-Americans was to separate them from the other group of workers and then to isolate them for economic reasons. So Japanese were treated that same way in World War II for economic reasons. We cannot escape from that fact. Thank, Thank you. I, so I, what I'm hearing is land, land as an asset that can be removed by a variety of ways that we've seen exercised throughout history. And then I'm also hearing about how do we alienate groups of people from one another and, and turning, turning our perceptions of one another uh, into something monstrous or worthy of fear or something like that is one way to do it. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, Christine is adding propaganda is prevalent and ever present, requiring constant vigilance to keep it in check. So it's something that we're that we know is happening today. Um, propaganda only works if we've created a culture of fear long before it's used. If someone's always out to get you, you can use propaganda. So this idea of propaganda having dire consequences is really important. And what I think is interesting, and I'm going to kind of you know invite you to journal on as an individual. Um, choose whichever one or many of these questions kind of speak to you. Um, but when, when you start to think about all of these, think about the, the choice that Andrea and I made to not show you propaganda, but rather to explore kind of the repercussions of it instead um, and, and start to kind of put on your teacher hat and think about how are the systems we discussed created and by whom, how does power play into all of that? If you were challenging your students to see the systems and then seek out evidence because you know that they're responsible for that, that those evidences that those systems are still in place, what 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 kind of evidence would be valid for supporting that the, the systems are still in place? Um, and then really putting on your teacher hat, what question would you add in order to turn some of this into a midpoint assessment or demonstration of understanding either of propaganda or World War II or the combination of both. So if you need any clarification on that, drop it into the chat. I'm gonna put mm, three minutes, three minutes feels like a good block of time on the um, timer. And again, this is just for you to start kind of distilling the, to just start distilling the thinking um, for yourself. And Sarah's noted in the chat, um, the Gordon Parks as a photographer of African American, um, Americans oppressed uh, might be an interesting um, kind of connection.
All right. So this is your independent journaling. This is just kind of a way to make sense of things. Um, our participant, Just Allen, noted um, in the chat that there are a good number of photographs um, that depict um, incarcerated Japanese Americans as really happy and contented. And that might be an interesting um, kind of line of inquiry to follow with students as well. Um, what I'm going to do we're going to kind of carry this thinking forward. I want to really uh, deliberately and explicitly start to transition into the kind of um, teacher mind um, to see how this would fit into your curriculum, or if you are one of our wonderful docents, how you might use this on a tour. Um, so the thing I want to make explicit first is that we have this whole, um, this whole, um, session, been using a thinking routine, which is component part of the agency by design set. Um, this is a, a research body out of Harvard Graduate School of Education. And the um, questions that you see here are just ways of kind of moving through and surfacing things that are operating all around us all the time that we become accustomed to or we don't necessarily get access to um, and and calling our attention to them and then starting to to think about them critically and think about what role we might be able to play um, or what role we currently play and how we might change that role one of the things that i have found most interesting um, is a consideration of different types of power and these might be very familiar to you which you know, in that case, jump in with ways that you've used this in your classroom or um, something that you have found to be particularly compelling about these distinctions. But just starting to think about how power over is different from power to, power with, or power within. And so if we were to challenge you to go back into the Densho timeline, for instance, um, where we really, you know, if I scroll back through the chat, I think we came out of that thinking about um, the longevity of the oppression, um, the comprehensiveness of the oppression. Um, if I challenged you to go back to through the timeline and um, seek also for evidence of power to or power within um, or power with perhaps we would be able to find um, a different kind of component or story to tell. Not that the first one isn't true, but it's kind of one of those yes and opportunities. There are, there are multiple truths um, in this case. So um, the closing discussion that I want to invite is here. And this is an opportunity to unmute or drop ideas in the chat box. But the first invitation is to go back through your notes. So you may remember that you started at the very beginning with this warm up question. Um, what content did you connect most to during school and why? What roles did you envision for yourself based on that learning? What story about people of Japanese descent comes most readily to mind when you think about World War II? And then just kind of zoom through the chat, look at your notes so that you're kind of reminding yourself of all that we did because we've covered a lot of ground together in this hour and 10 minutes. And so I'm gonna give you just like a minute to do that. And then when you feel like you've got your hands around what, what you've done, what thinking you've done, if you'll just put um, a why in the chat box, I will know that we are ready. I just wait for two more whys. Don't want to leave anybody behind. Awesome. All right. 
So my reason for doing this is like, this is obviously review. review. Um, it's also an opportunity to have a metacognitive moment. Um, my first question, and this is just a question to be really explicit, that this is something that we can do within our existing curriculum, right? So what content did we cover that you're responsible for in history, in social studies, in English, in wherever, whatever your area of expertise is, what content did we cover that, that you could say, yes, principal, we have in fact achieved that goal? And that's an actual question so that everybody can see that we have checked that box. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you, Ms. Downey. So what, what have we covered together during this session that you are actually responsible for teaching? Ms. Berger says learning about war and family, power of language and rhetoric, visual art, criticism of art, beautiful, describe, analyze. Oh my gosh, calling out the specific skills that we have been using, love it. Deciphering art, beautiful. Art and art history, gorgeous. Got a good number of art teachers in the room. I love that. Anything more that you are responsible for teaching? So we're just looking for like really clear connections to what you have to do in your classroom. World history and cultural studies, love it. Logos, ethos, and pathos. Thank you, Denise. So beautiful, right? Like we we see that there are a lot of different ways to hook this into what you're responsible for teaching. Um, how art talks to us and teaches us about people. Beautiful. Okay. So following on Miss Berger's note about how art teaches us about people, I'm just going to call attention again to the fact that we did not have you analyze a work of propaganda in order to look, in order to discuss propaganda. So my question to you becomes, what value does that offer? And I'm gonna call you all the way back to our warm-up questions where we were asking ourselves, what did we connect with during school and what futures did that help us envision? And then what story or stories do we tell about people of Japanese descent? What is the value of teaching about propaganda without showing propaganda? And if you need to unmute to talk it out, I welcome that or drop it in the chat box. Denise, tell me more about disarming resistance. I love these two words. I just want to make sure I get it. I just, I think sometimes when you show students that something that is obvious propaganda, like the last session where we were looking at some of those posters, especially if they identify with them, you've lost them. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah's noting um, offering the perspective of the voiceless versus people with power, um, supporting empathy with the people who have been oppressed. Noting uh, about immigration. Tell me more, Ms. Berger, about this idea of immigration to the USA. I just want to make sure I understand it. Maybe you're typing. I will look forward to it. Um, Emily's noting it becomes about the outward perspective rather than giving someone a chance to relate or, or form their own opinions. Ah, okay, beautiful. Abby's noting not perpetuating propaganda by giving it a voice, not focusing on a specific image allows us to think in broader terms. Beautiful. So this to me was a very antithetical and challenging appro uh, approach. And I am deeply indebted to Andrea for walking me through this. Um, and just to like tell a tale, we have an artwork in our collection that I have used a bunch in my teaching because I think it really makes a very blunt point about um, what is propaganda. And originally my plan was to put up this artwork and we we're gonna talk about it and then we we're gonna like take it apart and talk about why it's challenging and why it represents a bunch of racial stereotypes. 
And Andrea, um, if you don't mind telling tales on me, like how, how did you, how did you hold my hand through the process of, of undoing that? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's something that um, I have been in conversation uh, about with some colleagues and also with Elizabeth too, and kind of leading up to this is, uh, you know, what what um, what is the impact of showing propaganda or caricature? Um, and what what does what is the impact of that if someone unfortunately might see themselves in it because it's the only thing they see that might that kind of shares some kind of affinity? Where's the counter narrative to show a more positive story, a positive image that has uh, the humanity behind it, that has a voice behind it, um, that also has elements of celebration and joy? How can we expand how we see ourselves and what we're learning about? In order to feel like we belong and we're included, um, and um, yeah, so Elizabeth and I had great conversations about all the ways in which we can show and talk about this history without showing um, a lot of the really damaging stereotypical imagery of like the slanted eyes and the, all you know the the yellowish skin and the, the teeth, all of these really harmful images that we often see if we pull up images of World War II and Japan. And um, you know there there are ways we can talk about its its impact by just talking about how humans have had um, traumatic lived experiences through this time, like the impact of those harmful visuals led to the wrongful imprisonment of over one hundred and twenty thousand people. So um, because of this fear, this term of fear keeps coming back, which is so critical and so key. So yeah, so Elizabeth, like, I, we we had a good conversation about how can we. Um, Talk about this really heavy, complicated topic that um, will always be, uh, you know, a, 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 a tool in a powerful toolbox. How can we bypass that and really kind of talk about those who were really impacted by it and show show them as human beings to really kind of get back to that humanity? Thank you. So I'm going to stop the recording. And those of you who are watching the recording, I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to stop that recording. Um, and I am going